Okay, so moving on to the next section. I don't know if this is recording on that or not. I want to move it just in case, though. Okay, so differentiating between local and systemic responses. And we're going to talk about this a little bit next week, too. But when it's local, it means it's isolated to that area, and you already know this. Like, when you get a bee sting, you can actually get a bee sting as long as it stays up here and, like, the epidermis sort of jumps below the epidermis. As long as it doesn't penetrate into the blood and starts circulating through the system, it's local. You get that swelling. Like, when you get a mosquito bite, that's localized. It causes a mean in that one area and stays isolated to the area. Um, when you get it systemically, that means it got into the blood and travels. If you're allergic to something and it's a local infection, you get red puffiness. Like if you get exposed to it on the surface of your skin, you get localized. But if that gets in your body, what type of cell does it stimulate inside the circulating blood that releases histamine? The basophil, right? So if it's isolated up here, it triggers what type of cell? The mass of cells is when it's systemic, it's triggering the basophil. The other thing with systemic is anything that becomes systemic, even if it's localized with some of those white blood cell chemicals move into the blood, suddenly you get a systemic response. Every infection out there always stimulates some kind of a fever, period. We just have a rule of thumb. It doesn't matter what it is. You get a low-grade fever, you get a small fever anytime you're infected with anything. And of course you want to remember when it's causing a fever, the structure in the brain that's being triggered. Homeostasis center. Freezing, feeding, fighting, sex. Yeah, hypothalamus. Right. And then those chemicals, we call pyrogen because they generate a fire inside of you. And the plasma proteins they typically turn up are proteins that are related to things like complement. And then what was the question at the bottom? What are the symptoms of each? So localized edema versus having that fever would be the big difference. And then chronic inflammation. Chronic is anything that lasts more than two weeks. And the next slide goes into that in better detail. Or, sorry, two slides. So the next thing is hypercytokine. Hypercytokine emia. So it's telling you right away, hyper means more than usual. And then cytokines are those little... What was the other word for it that I told you you'd want to know? Inter yep. So the chemicals that talk between white blood cells. And then emia means it's where? In the blood. So above average cytokines in the blood. Here's the bad thing, is that if you start getting a high level of cytokines in the blood, if one white blood cell tells three other white blood cells just bad stuff, spread the word, they're going to release cytokines to tell, like, whatever, 12 other ones. What's going to happen? As you're releasing more and more and more cytokines, what's going to happen to that response? It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it actually creates a positive feedback loop. So that the more you release, the more you release. Are positive feedback loops usually good? No. So the only good ones are like menstrual cycle and childbirth. And that's debatable. But positive feedback loops are usually dangerous. In this hypercytokinemia, if you get a bigger than normal response, bless you, it can actually be fatal. It'll cause your fever to go higher and higher and higher. So it starts off with a low grade fever. Yeah, 101. And that causes more response. And then it goes to 102, 103, 104, and it just keeps getting worse. You get swelling and redness that keeps getting worse and worse. If it becomes systemic, it doesn't stay isolated to that limb or that area. It probably goes everywhere. Where would you really worry about swelling? Brain, in the throat, around the lungs. Yeah. And then because you're so busy cranking up the heat, making all these proteins circulating, you start getting tired. You have nausea, which means you probably have swelling being affected at what part of the brain? The brain stem. Yep, where that medulla oblongata is. So hypercytokinemia. Positive feedback loops that can be potentially dangerous. Over-responsive white blood cells. Okay. And then inflammation. What can happen? Um, I forgot why we were coming to this. Two slides back, I said we were going to talk about this. Oh, chronic inflammation, there we go. Yeah, thanks. So with chronic inflammation, if it can't be eliminated within how much time? About two weeks. Yeah, so if you get a mild infection or an inflammation, let's say it gets into your lungs, what will happen is that you'll try and kill it with your right blood cells. The first ones are the macrophages, the alveolar macrophages, which are in the lungs. Alveolar, they're already there. When the blood starts circulating, what's the first one that's going to come on the scene? 
neutrophils. Yeah. So they're going to come in and try and kill it. If it can't kill within two weeks, it says, screw it. We're not going to kill this. We're going to just have to isolate it. So it actually starts trying to block up whatever it is. You've got this infection in here, and all these white blood cells are coming into the area, and they're going to say, forget it. Let's just build a wall around the infection and isolate it. And what you see this commonly is TB. So TB is a type of not the bacteria. TB is really teeny tiny and sneaky. We usually associate with being in the lungs, but you can go in the brain, the spinal cord, you go to the muscles, you can go all over the place. But when TB is in the lungs, it's hard to kill because it gets inside of macrophages. And so those macrophages have to be actually killed by other macrophages. So what your body will do is say, screw it, let's just isolate this. It makes a big clump in your lungs. Is that... I didn't mean, think about it, I just dumb it after that really bad. But it forms these little little clumps all over in your lungs. What's that doing to your air exchange? making it harder and harder to exchange air. So, if you're starting to clump this stuff up and you're tracking waters and fluids and what can eventually happen is it suffocates in your own lungs. But this thing's called a granuloma. The white blood cells get trapped on the inside of it and then you have fibroblasts that come along and they build a wall around the outside of fibrous material. Uh, a really good example of this is when I was a kid, my brother and I used to, I grew up by the, down by the river. And, we would go down and play along the river, and he accidentally fell down and got a stick in his leg. But <laughs> he fell down, he, and he got the stick in his leg, and we pulled it out, thinking, oh my god, mom's going to find out. And, you know, Let me just get that for you. And so we pulled it out, and of course it was bleeding. It's hard to hide that. And so when we got back up there, mom, of course, dumped hydrogen peroxide all over and tried to clean it the best she could. And it seemed okay, but it looked like it was getting infected, so she took him to the hospital. And they went in, they cleaned up the area, and then they stitched it up. He had this nasty, real nasty scar. still has it on his leg. And the next year, over the next year, he started having seizures. He started getting really bad fevers. And nobody knew why. We had no clue. They thought that maybe he just, this was the way he ate. The seizures aren't always from a known cause. We don't have to And so the doctor said, well, he's getting these seizures and these fevers because of the seizure activity. And so they just kind of blew it off. But then about two years down the road, we were playing again, and he accidentally fell down and broke his leg. Same way. And when he broke the leg and they took an x-ray, they looked at it. And when they went in, they pulled a piece of stick out. That stick had been in his leg for two years. And what had happened is his body built a granuloma around it because it couldn't eat the whole stick. It started building a granuloma, but the toxins from the bacteria, it was by the river, so the stick was covered in bacteria from the river. And it was slowly releasing toxins into his body. When they pulled that stick out after the broken leg, he never had another seizure or didn't get those fevers again. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. And I don't think he remembers to this day why he fell down. Because we talked about it about a month or so ago. And he's like, yeah, I remember falling down. And that was about it. Yeah, you fell. <laughs> <laughs> you fell hard, too. <clears throat> That sinking dog that pushed you down, that was terrible. <laughs> but in situations like this, like toxins, some toxins can't easily be cleaned up, so your body tries to isolate them off. Other things, like fat. Fat cells, what they do is they're chronic. They get bigger and bigger and bigger, and they're actually, and this is a thing you'll hear more and more about, because they're recently discovering that obesity triggers your immune response. It triggers an inflammation and inflammatory response. The more extra fat you have, the more hormones that are released to trigger inflammatory responses. And unfortunately, those inflammatory responses make your blood vessels get inflamed, start causing scar tissue to line the inside of the blood vessels. They start triggering the immune system, start moving in tissues and cause destruction of tissues. So they put a link of like tissues, um, like muscle cells or uh, liver cells, it's stimulated by absolute cell interleukin type of stuff, chemicals, they get stimulated and they block up their activity. They turn down whatever their normal focus is so that they can start putting these barriers up against anything else that's out there. If this is a liver cell that's supposed to be absorbing glucose, what's it not making it anymore? Or what's it turned down? It's insulin receptors, right? So you can have insulin, you can make lots of insulin in the pancreas, but the problem is that what happens to the ability to these cells to absorb it? It goes down. So it causes type 2 diabetes. Remember, type 1 is the pancreas itself. Type 2 is when your tissues aren't responsive to that insulin. So that's what they think is one of the links behind having a heavier weight and having diabetes. Sorry, how does the insulin receptor work? Is 
The adipocyte in the wisdom can go mediators that trigger inflammation, which tells all the other cells in the body to slow down through the normal process and just be ready for this infection agent, whatever it is. Just like flipping the high alert system and freaking everybody out. And so it freaks these cells out, they don't want to absorb insulin anymore. And then it causes, if they eat something sugary, what happens to their blood sugars? They spike really high, they can't store it, so later when they have a low blood sugar, what happens? Nothing to release. They become hypoglycemic, which are the symptoms that you've seen in the diabetics. You get a little bit of something too sugar, you get hyperglycemia, but three hours later, you get hyperglycemia. And then that's the link with obesity. And it's not just like in the liver blocking insulin, it's all over the place. So looking at the blood vessels, causing atherosclerosis, which we talked about in cardiovascular, which is part of the liver, your scar tissue going up around the eyes. In the brain, things like Alzheimer's, plaques. So lots and lots of problems. Just to get everything on that slide. So granuloma I talked about. And it's when the body can't do what? If it can't kill the infection, it just blocks it off, builds a wall around it, right? And the next section, I'm going to kind of condense it a little bit. Some of the terms you can know, with, like resolution versus repair. Resolution is when you get a little tiny injury and it fixes itself and it's as good as new. Like when you get paper cuts, they're really minor. You're like, ah, 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 it stings, but in a week, you don't even know they were ever there. It's exactly right as it was before. Repairs when you have extension damage, and it has to do a lot of maintenance and a lot of fixing. So typically, resolution happens with things that can be healed in a week. Repairs when it's really extensive, and it takes several weeks, potentially several months. And with repair, one of the characteristics is a scar. You've got a huge collagen structure that makes it really dense, and very strong, but the problem is, what if its purpose was to contract the regime? Does dense and strong help? Like, let's say you destroy, and this is going to be a superficial one, but heart. You have that heart contractile tissue, cardiac muscle. When you replace the scar tissue, what did you just lose? Contractility. Yep. You have a strong patch, so it's nice and tight, but the purpose of the heart is to expand and then contract back. So if it's really tight, what's it not going to do? Other than contract, it won't expand completely anymore either. So the key terms here, resolution and repair. Resolution is a brief you know, process. It's a minor fix to a problem where repair is more extensive. Another way to describe it is primary versus secondary. When it's primary, it's minimal tissue loss. Secondary means it's a really, really damaging situation. Primary... Not only would it be uh, like paper cuts, but even scalpel incisions. A nice fine cut. Minimal repair. Secondary is extensive, something like a pressure sore, where it's damaging lots of tissue in an area. You get this massive remodeling. And then I put this process in here so you look at it. You probably looked at these types of processes before we were in that and the process. So you make the cut. The cuts are storing with inflammatory cells. What's the primary inflammatory cell that's going to come in? The neutrophils. Yep, so within the first 24 hours, you've got all these neutrophils flooding in. After the 24 hours, then you start seeing the cleanup food. It's coming in to eat everything. What do they call it? Feeders. Macrophages. Yep, so if you look at the tissue over this progression, within the first 24 hours, you've got all these neutrophils coming in. You've got all the original cells that are trying to replicate through what process? Myosis or mitosis? Mitosis, making twins and filling in the hole. And then the macrophage come in and start cleaning up the debris underneath. And then this can keep going for weeks to potentially months, depending on how intense the, the process is. But the fibroblasts come in, they start repairing underneath here, they start pulling things together. What's interesting is that these cells along here, they'll actually fill with something called actin and myosin. What do those two things do when they're exposed to each other? They track. Yep, they bind, they pull. Why would you want actin and myosin here? It's pulling, exactly, it's pulling both sides of the skin together to hold it tight. That's why when at first, when you get that cut, you, get to, you have this like dip down in, and then a couple weeks later, what's it actually do? After the scab fell off, it's squeezing. It's not like muscle where it contracts or relaxes. It just contracts to pull together. And that scar actually does what? It raises. Yeah, so it raises it a little bit, holds up. Kind of a cool process. 
And then you can see the, the step by step. So you have the filling where you fill in the hole, and then the ceiling when you start lining up with epithelium, and then the shrinkage, the contraction between the actin and life. And then debridement is talking about destroying the tissue underneath. And in a uh, in a clinical setting, you can do debridement where you cut the tissue off, but this is talking about maybe your body destroying that extra tissue right now. And you don't have to memorize this. This is just there if you want to look at it later. But it's the reconstructive and the maturation phase. So about 3 to 18 days, you're passing this big hole, so something like a big wound. And the maturation can actually take up to two years to fix. Okay, this part you do have to know, though. So dysfunction is why you're going through the inflammatory response. So what happens if things don't go the way they're supposed to? Like if you have a hemorrhage, if you're hemorrhaging while you're trying to heal, what problem could that introduce? That means you're still bleeding, right? So, well, number one is if you're still bleeding, you're not properly connecting things, so you're not healing the wound. What else are you exposed to more when you have open blood vessels? More infection, more bacteria. Right? And the next thing could be a problem with the fibrous adhesion, so the sticking together. You could actually think of um, like clotting factors that would something like hemophilia. They have that hemorrhage, but they also can't adhere anything. They can't connect things together. And then, of course, if you get an infection, so you're starting to heal and then you get more infection into it, it's just going to start destroying that tissue even more. Wound sepsis is talking about being overwhelmed by an infection, infected agent. It doesn't have to necessarily be a bacteria. It's probably be a fungus. It can be um, extra toxins. Why would hypovolemia cause problems with healing? What's it referring to first? Low blood volume, right? So if you have low blood volume, what's probably the problem? Well, not the cause, but what's going to be the problem with healing? You're not bringing like white blood cells, you're not bringing the nutrients to the area. So it's a slow healing process, which also increases the risk of infection. And how about hypo? Protein, you know, protein. Not a protein. What would you need protein for? To rebuild the tissue, exactly. So if you don't have the proper protein, so think of kids that are malnourished. If they get cuts and wounds, they don't heal properly because of it. And it's not just those feeling like the connected collagen, it's also the properties of the inside white blood cells. The chemical agents. They use make enzymes out of protein. And then this last one, anti-inflammatory steroids, like cortisol. If somebody has a, a big gaping wound, why would it be bad for them to take cortisol? What's it do to, the, what's it do to their immune system? It turns down your immune system, which increases the risk of infection. And I think you kind of saw the theme. all these increase the risk of further infection. And I have a couple pictures of some of them. Okay, so problems during the reconstruction phase, you can go from things like keloids, hypertrophic scars, to actually having ulcers where that did proper circulation, to things like contracture where the burn felt very properly. So that first one up in the top corner is a keloid, and this is just a person that had their ear pierced, but look at that abnormal growth. Would you say that's a normal scar? Nope. This is keloid. The key with keloids separating them from a hypertrophic scar. Hypertrophic means over-nurtured scar. Hypertrophic scars, they grow straight up, basically. They overgrow height-wise. But they're limited to where the cut or the, the problem is at. So the keloids, they grow up deeper, but they also grow out. Typically, the darker the skin, the higher the risk of keloids. Or hypertrophic scars just go straight up. About normal, they're considered actually a tumor, an abnormal growth. So they're not technically just a tumor. The abnormal growths. And then something like this impaired epithelialization. This is a person with diabetes. Why did they probably get this in the first place? Poor circulation. Yeah. And then, of course, poor circulation, and this gets eaten away, they can't bring in healing factors. So they're not going to heal properly, and they also don't increase the risk of infection. And this last one, contracture. 
So a contracture in this sense of the word talking about when you have a burn. The burns, they usually have a tendency to feel really tight and they pull the skin extremely tight. This is the full range of motion for the skin after you had a burn. So when his skin healed, they didn't stretch it out, they didn't give it like a, a range of motion to keep it extended. It feel tight, so now he can only lift his arm that high. The situation. But the contracture is referring to the burn healing too tightly and limiting range of motion. And the next one, dehiscence. Dehiscence is when you pull apart the wound. Dehiscence has a tendency to happen more to people that don't slow down the use of that structure, so they get some kind of incision, maybe they had surgery, and this person, they had stapled together. And then they try and use it before it has a chance to heal completely. The other common reason that people have dehiscence is because of obesity. Or too much fat tissue on anything. Poor circulation and too much pressure at the side of the wound. So excessive use when they shouldn't. And obesity. And then the biggest risk with dehiscence is that you're exposing all of this to bacteria. Your first line of defense is the skin. If the skin's not even connected, you've got to put a lot of dependence on that second line of defense. And this is usually kind of dried out, not good circulation, so the infection just keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And I have no idea why this person had this surgery, but maybe you can see their belly button at the bottom. So it's a kind of abdominal surgery. It shouldn't, yeah. If they. Because if, if they're putting too much pressure behind it, it's still going to pop. Okay, next section. So, adaptive immunity, which is the next chapter. I have to put them here on the four guys. All right, and again, we'll keep going through these different cells. Like we've already talked a little bit about the thalamus cells, the beta cells, the mesa cells, and the mast cells. We talked a little bit about the macrophages, and we'll talk more about the natural killer cells. Um, the complement proteins, one of those steps in the complement cascade. So remember, it's non-specific; it doesn't matter. Something should be there; it's going to stick all over. What was that hole that's going to try and put in bacteria? Let me see. Remember it happened. Otherwise, it's going to act like a little kid and try and drag the thing down. We'll talk about T cells and B cells too during this part. Oops, so wrong one. Adaptive immunity. Ooh, a star must be important. So, throw line defense. This is specific. The other two didn't care what got inside of you. The first and the second line of defense. The skin, the, the barriers on the surface, like biochemical barriers. The second one is mast cells under the surface, the macrophages. They don't care what it is. They attack it. This one's specific. So this one, your body has to know what that stuff is. And on the concept, you really have to walk away from the section. So you need to understand what an antigen is. We'll talk about the lymphocytes and what they do. We'll talk about antibodies, and we'll talk about how memory works. So the first thing. When we talk about the different types of immunity, and by the way, immunity technically falls into the third group. Immunity doesn't fall into type 1 or type 2, it falls specifically into the third line of defense. Okay. Immune refers to having a memory of something. You can describe it as natural or acquired. And natural means you're born with it. So, whatever you're born with. Acquired means that you were exposed to it, you learned it, and then you developed it. So, natural means that you learned it through mommy. Acquired means that you learned it through your own experiences in the world. And how we test this, we usually just extract a little bit of blood. We can look through the different chemicals that are in your blood and see what you've been exposed to in your life. Like HIV. When we do a test for HIV, it's kind of interesting how they do it. They'll take a sample of your blood and they make these little things, they call them wells. They're actually about the size of that. And on the inside of the well, they'll put little markers that know what HIV is along the outside of the well. They're, they're lining it. And then they put a drop of your blood inside the well. When that blood goes in here, if you've had HIV, you've got little markers inside your body for HIV. These things like to attack HIV. So what's going to happen if you have HIV in here? It attacks it, and it sticks the HIV 
particles along the edge, like this. And then what they do is they shine it through light and see that all those particles stick along the edges of the or the melting stick. And then if they do start sticking along the edge, and they say, oh, we have HIV. Your blood has been exposed to HIV. And we'll talk about HIV later, too. But what they do is they test for this stuff. They pull out a little sample of your blood, and then they can see how does your body respond to this stuff. All right, so natural versus acquired. And the next is active versus pa passive. So natural and acquired. Natural, you're born with it. Acquired means that you know how to use it. Active means that you learned on your very, very own. Passive means you gave you that immunity. You acquired it, but you didn't work for it. It was just given to you. Passive, no energy required. So, when we give you a vaccination, we give you a little sample or a particle from wherever that, thing, that infected agent is. Your body has to recognize it. Your body has to start building a defense against it. Your body's putting work in and making like a defense against this thing. We consider that passive or active. That's active. Yep. And then, when we talk about passive, when you're... Uh, I want to ask you this one later, so I have to come up with that idea in my mind. Oh. There we go. So passive. You get bitten by an animal that's rabbit. Okay, so you have this raging virus that's going through your body. It travels fast. It gets into your nervous system. It starts moving towards your brain really, really quick. There's no time for you to say, hey, this stuff's probably bad. Let's make an immune system against it and we'll work on this. By the time you did that, you'd be dead. So what they do is they actually take these immune factors from another animal. It used to be a horse and now they can do it to rats and rabbits and goats and all that stuff. But these other animals that they don't have a problem with the rabies, they make an immune system strong against it. We pull it out of them and we actually inject it into you. Did you have to do any work? Nope, we just gave it to you. That would be passive. So active means you actually have to do something. If you um, are a kid and some other kid sneezes on you and you pick up that, that virus and you get really sick, but then another kid a month down the road sneezes on you with the same virus, you already have a, uh, an immune system against that. What did you have? An active or a passive immune system? Active. Yeah, that first kid that got you sick made you try on your own immune system to prepare for it later. Um, let's see another example. Of course, you know, the flu, when you get the flu shot, what would that be? Active or passive? It would be active. We're giving you a little sample of the stuff so that you can fight against it. What about when you're born? Your immune system sucks right when you're born. So, when you start drinking breast milk, mom gives you antibodies, these little things to protect you. What would that be? Passive. Yeah, it's passed on from mom to baby. Passive. Oops. Immunizations are active. Yep. So, like when you get the MMRIs, you can use the bumps for the belly. Um, MMRI, right? I say MR, and I always want to think about it. The neuro person. So, when you get the measles, bumps, and bella, you're getting little samples of the products. Um, some of them are living, some of them are dead. Depends on how dangerous the thing is. So usually, and we'll talk about that actually next week. But it's extremely dangerous, then they don't even want that thing alive. They shred it, and they just give you pieces of it. So there's no risk of you getting sick from it. But your body recognizes the outside, like the skin of the invader. So that if that invader gets in, they go, ooh, crap, there it is, kill it. And then other ones that are alive, they give it to you, but they can't make you sick. That way they can travel around your body really easy, but you can fight them off, too. It's almost like a hunting game for your body. Okay, the structures I told you had to know. The key players in the immune system are antigens and antibodies. An antigen is an antibody generator. So what's it make you make? Antibodies. The antigen is the thing in your body that says, this doesn't belong. So, on the surface of bacteria, bacteria has these little antigens. So, it's kind of like this thing up here. If I have a bacteria, the antigens are, if this is the bacteria, it's just the whole speck on the surface. And these bacteria, depending on what they are, they basically have a fingerprint that identifies them. They have, might have a little triangular bumps, they might have little circular bumps, they might have little square ones, they might have zigzag bumps. They have these bumps all over the place that say, this is what this is. Each one of these little bumps is an antigen. Your body actually has antigens for cells. So if your cell is like this, and it says, 
Here's my antigen. Here's another antigen. This is telling my body what? Kill that, but don't eat me. Right? So don't kill me. So you have these little antigens inside, like, like, on your blood cells. On your red blood cells, you have these little structures. We refer to them as the A, Bs, and the A, Bs. Oh, yes. There is no O. But the A, Bs, they're antigens when it starts to red blood cells. And then you'll make an antibody against the other form that you don't have. Why do you not make an antibody against the type that's on your red blood cell? Because, exactly, your body will start attacking it. Your body looks for antigens and kills them. So, if this bacteria up here with a little round one is in your body, your body will make an antibody that has a perfect shape to bind to that. And the cool thing, like I said, all the way over here on the right side, you see this has different types of antigens on it. So, if this one specifically binds to that antibody, what will this one on the right bind to? It'll bind to that same one, right? Because it has a bump, but it will also bind to this one on the end that has like a square rectangle. And it's really cool, it's like a lock and key mechanism. The lock and key have to fit together. Practically perfectly. So the antigens are the things that are not on itself. It says this isn't you, kill it, attack it, try and destroy it. Most infective agents have it. Actually all all infective agents have it. Anything that can cause or stimulate inflammation or infection response have it. Um, even particles on like rubber gloves if people have an allergy against the gloves that they use in their clinic, then they have an allergy on their body attacks. Uh, infection agents like bacteria, fungus, blah, 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 and then non infection. So, environmental things like pollen. If you're allergic to something, there's an antigen on that thing that stimulates you. Some people are allergic to mosquito antigens. So, if they get bitten by a mosquito, it swells up really bad and just drives them crazy. Um, drugs, penicillin, some people have an allergic response to penicillin, because penicillin has a little antigen on the structure that say, hey, this doesn't belong to me. Besides, it's made from a what? A mold, right? It's made from a fungus. It shouldn't be in there. You don't want that in there. And then epitopes and hap happens. Happens are actually the smallest type of an antigen. They're the absolute smallest. Happens are actually too small to be recognized. Uh, so in this situation, if this is my antigen circle, the happen might be just one slice of that pie. It's not big enough to be recognized by itself. It has to contribute to this shape to actually be recognized. And then an epitope is an entire region. So let's say on a bacteria, let's say overall this part is the epitope, this whole region of bacteria. It's a larger area. So the antigens, the key player, the haptogens are the fragments of the antigen and the epitope of the things that give the antigen to And then these are kind of important. So what makes the antigen the best? So what makes these things, in other words, what stimulates your immune system the best is if the antigens are large. So what about a haptogen? What's wrong with that? It's too small. Yeah, it's teeny tiny. It's way too small to be detected. So having a large, having a large structure with lots of antigens on it is way better for you. So if a virus infects you and it's a very simple virus with very few antigens, let's say it only has one antigen, it's not going to be the best stimulus. What's really good are those viruses that have tons of different antigens so you have a better chance of finding them. So if something is large, it's easier. Something else that looks more foreign. There are some viruses out there that look like you. We'll talk about it. Epstein-Barr. Have I mentioned that yet this semester? So Epstein Barr, it's interesting because what they find is that some of the little antigens of Epstein Barr look like myelin sheep. You want myelin sheep inside of you? Where do you find myelin sheep? Around neurons, right? It's around the axon. And we'll talk about this, it's called molecular mimicry, where two things look pretty similar. So your body sees Epstein Barr and goes, holy crap, that stuff's bad. It causes mono, it can make you really sick, it might cause young gray disorder. It's bad stuff. And then when that Epstein-Barr is killed, you have all these cells that are hunting for Epstein-Barr, and then they see the myelin sheet that looks like Epstein-Barr, what are they going to do? They'll attack that too. You know what disorder? Destroying myelin sheet. Yeah, it has a bunch of MS. They found that if you've had mono, you have a higher risk of getting MS. 
And we'll talk about that too. About 60% of us in this room have actually had exposure to Epstein Barr, but only a small percentage of you have actually had mono. How many people have had mono? Wow, that is a really small percent. Okay. Uh, oh, we're still working on this. And then complex. So I kind of said said it's large, but it's a large antigen. It's easy to detect for it to happen. But it's very complex. It's also really good. And then the fourth thing is if it's plentiful, it's better for you to have a lot of pieces of that bacteria in your body to attack it quicker than to have just one. Or whatever that structure is. So if there are a lot of pieces of it, it's easier for you to identify it and trigger your immune response. Because all it takes is one or two pieces and then your immune system is like on high alert. So the more pieces you have, the faster you can turn on your immune system. Okay. And then the adaptive immunity. You have to have exposure to something in the past. So there's one exception to this rule. When you're first being developed, your immune system starts making lots and lots of little immune cells. And it still makes these T and B cells, these adaptive immunity, even though you really haven't experienced anything yet. Like there's nothing you've been experienced to. So what they do is they go to this assembly line, and it will randomly assign combinations of things that you've never even seen before. It'll say, well, here's this shape. And if you never experienced it, they really never experience it. But let's say that you, you make something for this shape, and then you got in the real world, and it gets in your body, and you're like, holy crap, they got to have this. And you plug it in. So as an embryo, you'll start randomly ass like assigning codes, different shapes, and hoping that they'll be your good ones. Here's the problem. What if you randomly assign one that looks like you? What would happen? So if you randomly assign yourself to attack something that looks like you, what would happen to you? Autoimmune, exactly. We start coming back and attacking yourself. So, what's kind of cool is this process. As these cells are developing in the embryo, they go through this process and they go through this, basically, the thymus. And as they're going through the thymus, they're randomly assigned this code and they go ship out. Here's your code. But as they're getting ready to leave, they'll run, off, run by one of your cells, and if they attach to your cell, that means they had the code to kill you. Do you want that when leaving the thymus? No. no. So, what's kind of cool is if it attaches there, guess what happens to it? It's healed, it's shredded. So there's no way this thing can get out of your bloodstream and replicate. So it's kind of a cool, it, it's called clonal selection. So this clonal diversity, what it does is it just randomly assigns what you do so you have some kind of immune system going into the world. But that clonal selection, what happens is if you code it for a self antigen, then it's destroyed. And we're kind of talking about birth, like I was saying, birth is a miracle. Because there are a lot of cells that are fertilized, eggs that are fertilized, showing you're making less than 10% of it. This could be another one of the processes. What if early in embryonic development, that one got loose? What could it have done to that embryo? Mm -hmm. Sort of killing it. Yeah, sort of destroying the embryo. That could be another problem that happens. It's, just, it's amazing how we get out there. All right, the structures you need to remember, pay attention to, I already mentioned one. So, the thymus, it's like boot camp for immune cells. Where are all of the immune cells made? Where did they originate? The bone marrow. They all originate in the bone marrow. So, you have the bone marrow, and then once you're ready to go to the boot camp, they can go to one of two boot camp locations. They can either go to the thymus, or they can go to another section of the bone marrow. If they go to the thymus, we call them a T cell. If they go to the other area of the bone marrow, we call them a B cell. So they were made in the bone marrow, then they're shipped over to wherever they're going to mature. Then once they're done, then they go into the blood and circulation, then they go to their destination. So they go to places like the tonsils, and they hang out and they wait from the tonsils surrounding your oral cavity. They go to the lymph node and they sit there and wait. So that if you collect some bacteria in your lymph and it gets up to the lymph node, it's waiting to ambush the lymph node. And that's the same thing with the spleen. Hangs out in the spleen, waiting for something to get in the blood and just kills it. And then those are the main ones you want to pay attention to. Things like the lymphoid tissue, the malt, the mucosa associated lymphatic tissue, and the GI tract. It's just the same idea. You have these other tissues that are around the body. These mature cells are going at it. So that if you have some kind of bacteria that's in your GI tract, you get that as a tool. You kill it. But you want to remember the central and the peripheral one primarily. 
Okay, next keywords, humoral and cell mediated immunity. What I want you to remember with humoral, it means fluids. And the cell you want to associate with the humoral is the B cell. And then the T cell is cell media. It means that the T cells, they actually do the work. So humors, it's a word that Hippocrates came up with. He, he labeled the different humors based on the fluids in the body in different colors. Like um, for bile, it was more of a yellow color. And if you bled, it was a red color. And if it was infected, and it seemed like it was more dark. So it was the black substance, which was evil and good or that. But we don't use those terms because we're beyond the witchcraft, focus, focus, craft, that you do. But anyway, we're not. But the humorals, it's still, it's still the fluids. And the reason they call it humoral versus cell media is they took a sample of plasma and they pulled all the cells out and then they dumped it on an infective agent. And when the infective agent died, they said, there must be something about this fluid that's killing it. But we don't know what it is. Did it have anything to do with the cells at that point? Because what did they do? They pulled all the cells out, so it wasn't cell media, according to them. It was something natural in the fluid. Later we figured out it was made by the cells. For those cell media, it means that the cells had to be present to kill that infected agent. So they took another sample of blood with the red blood cells and white blood cells in it, put it on the infected agent, and they watched the story of the infected agent. So humoral means that the cells didn't have to be present. Cell media means the cells did have to be present. <laughs> in humoral, it's the B cells that make <coughs> these factors. In cell media, the T cells actually have to be present to keep the killing. And they're not completely independent like they used to believe it. They depend on each other. So you need to have the, the T and B cells there to have that humoral uh, response. They, they define it as whether there's food with cells or the food without cells. And the cells immune response are different than the inflammatory response. Inflammatory response had to do with the second line of defense. Was it specific? Nope, non specific. It attacked anything. So with the third line of defense, this memory, the immune, is based on specificity. Whatever you're attacking is specific. We have to know exactly what it is. So these T and B cells, they go through your system. If you have a brand new bacteria you've never seen before, the T and B cells go, hey, buddy, just move right on by. Okay. The immune system has a lasting memory. It stays around forever and ever and ever. There are some exceptions to the rule. Like, have you ever had to be revaccinated or something? What do you have to agree back in the quarter of the seven to ten years? Tetanus. Yeah. So, lasting memory. And what do we call it? I just said it. We call this immunity. And then the last thing is the antigens are what cause the immune response. Okay, first cells. So, the first ones you have to know are the B lymphocytes. And the B were associated with what? Cell mediated or humoral? Humoral. It's a humoral, humoral situation. And you've got potentially 100 million different antigen combinations that, that you can have. What's interesting is because of that random assignment that we were talking about with coronal diversity, is that there are some things that we are immune to that we don't even know about this planet. So it's funny because the person that was teaching me this stuff, that was his way of saying, we must have evolved from, that, from alien life out there. Whether you believe in aliens or not, I think that was kind of <laughs> Anyway, so 100 million different possible antigens. But here's the trick. One B cell can only recognize one of those antigens. So if this one B cell is cruising along, the other 99 million, 99 cells, if they come by this one B cell, it doesn't matter. It doesn't recognize them, so it's three figures moves on by. So it's very specific. It has to be specific to that one cell. <clears throat> right, once they're activated, so if I turn on this B cell, the B cell is just floating through my system. It's waiting. It knows that it should fight against something, but that thing's not there. Once it's activated, it turns into something called a plasma cell. And the plasma cells, they start making tons and tons of these things called antibodies. The B cells make the antibodies. So the activated B cell called a plasma cell. It makes tons of antibodies. T cells do not make antibodies. It's the antibodies that were in that humoral response that they couldn't see. They knew they pulled the white blood cells out, but these antibodies were still in the system and they were attacking. It was 
feeling that flu, that humor, and we're attacking the infected agent. That's where they're like, well, we don't know. It's just something natural inside that liquid. So it's because of the B cells that we're there. So the B cells can differentiate when they're activated and turn into this active cell, but then they'll replicate. What process do they go through? Mitosis, yep. So they'll replicate and they'll actually make a copy of a fighting like a warrior now, but then they make another one that right, runs off and hides in the closet for later. So it hides until this infection is gone, and then later it comes back out in case what happens. You get reinfected, right? So these will fight and fight and fight and fight and fight until they die, and then after the infection, these who are hiding in the closet will pop out, and then they'll start circulating way to that next infection. So when the second infection comes along, you're like, I remember this battle, I remember how it was won, I remember what it took to beat it, and now that wipe it out right away. So it's like chicken pox. The first exposure, you start making lots and lots of antibodies, but the rate of making antibodies is not nearly as fast as the infection is spread. So you start getting the symptoms of chicken pox. But some of these hide in closets later. So let's say that two years down the road, you're in the same room with a kid that has chicken pox and they sneeze on you. What happens? You pummel the kid and say, don't sneeze on me, you little jerk. And then <laughs> you don't get sick, right? What usually happens is you breathe in those particles from the chicken pox. And you may feel like, oh, I'm a little tired that night. But what happens is these memory cells they say, hey, I remember that chicken pox. It was easy to beat. Let's just replicate and we'll take it like out. So you expose the chicken pox a second time, but you don't actually get the symptoms because you killed it before it had a chance to grow time. Can you get, can you get chicken pox more than once? Some people do. Yeah. Some people it's just a fluke and they get it. Oh, yeah. Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, so there are yeah, 100 million different in the hospital, mm -hmm. but there's actually, based on what we were looking at earlier, like the there's really just one response where it drops those the uh, columnar MAC. Oh, jacket. sorry. Yeah, that's the complement cascade. That's a, that's a different process. Okay. This is... This is the uh, B cells response. So you're right. The complement does one thing. It likes to go for the MAC, or it sticks all over the invader until B cells can come along and, and do the work. So if it's if it triggers the complement cascade, it'll either pop the bacteria or it'll weigh it down. If that bacteria is recognized by the B cells, the B cells will start spitting antibodies all over it, which will help destroy it too, or weigh it down even more. Or the T cells will actually come along and put a hole right in it, which is the next cell to pop up. Yeah, Lots of different small processes in here. When I looked at the immune system, what helped me remember was I thought of like the military too. So with the military, the B cells are like the Air Force. These B cells, when they're activated, they like to fly over the enemy and just drop stuff on them. And the stuff they drop are these little circulating antibodies. They dump them in the blood and then they don't have to get their hands dirty because the antibodies will go attack the invader. So like this, here's your bacteria. It attacks the invader, sticks all over the invader, prevents the invader from targeting you, and then they can be cleaned up easily from the body. With a B cell, they didn't have to be cleaned up very touching the mask and very bacteria. But these antibodies, they have another name too, they're called immunoglobulins. So sometimes you'll see them referred to as an Ig or an AD. Ig means immunoglobulin, AD means antibody, but they're the same thing. And you can see the whole process. So remember how I told you that macrophage before? It likes to eat the cell. It keeps what it wants, uses it for good reasons, and then gets rid of the rest. But it takes a little piece of that bacteria and pokes it up on the surface on a stake. So there's that little red antigen on the bacteria. This macrophage will put it up on the stake and parade around looking for the B cells and says, hey, B cell, this is what the invader looks like. It's delicious. Have one. And so this B cell says, okay, I'll recognize that thing, and I'll start making antibodies against it. So now the B cell will start dumping these antibodies that are perfect fit for those little red structures. It's dumping it all over the place. As this thing replicates, it takes the memory cell and hides it off in the closet for later. So there's the whole process. And then this is the picture that I actually came from your textbook. So you can see it's stimulating, it gets proliferating, which means replicating. Here's your perfect clone. Here's the clone that's going to get thick with endoplasm reticulum down here and start making lots of protein antibodies that push out. It's like a weather man. And then we're just moving down to the southwest. <laughs> so it's like pushing those antibodies out. And then the memory cell over here is going to go high to it. And the 
And, and what do you call the activated one that's going to do the fighting now? Has a special name. The B cell that's activated is called a plasma cell. Yeah. And then the dormant cells go off and hide in the corner. And then, ooh, cytokines. Probably an interleukin. Where did that come from? To another white blood cell. Yeah. So in this situation, it says from the healthy T cell, which is white blood cell, tells this B cell, hey, there's an invader beyond high alert. Right. This is what the antibody or the immunoglobulin looks like. So remember, the antibody itself, you always draw them like little Ys because they, they have kind of that structure. They have this long, firm base coming out, and then they split off in a few directions. This is kind of cool because this is like the, the lock on your front door. It has a specific combination on it that detects one of those kind of different keys. So here you have this one amino body with two locks. It's waiting for the right key, like a locking key mechanism. What's the name of the cell that makes an amino body? It's an activated B cell, which is specifically called a plasma cell. Okay. And then when you look at these antibodies, they actually have different shapes and they have different purposes. And we call them, excuse me, <laughs> call them different classes. Now the coffee's coming back to haunt me. Okay. In, in general, and we'll talk about uh, two slides from now, we'll talk about the specific classes, but their purposes. So one way that it works is it directly attacks the bacteria. And in this example, you can see the bacteria in there. What are these called? Don't look at just epitopes, but in general, these things on the surface trigger a response called antigens. Yeah. So the epitopes that region. The antigens triggers this response. Here you have an immunoglobulin, an antibody, Ig, is coming along, it's looking for that antigen, it binds to the antigen and says, ah, I know you, and it sticks to it. So it's going to stick to it, it's going to do a couple things. If it directly attacks, it can neutralize. What if that pointy thing is dangerous to you? What does it just do? There's a safety cap on it. Is it dangerous to you anymore? Nope, it just neutralizes it. And the next one is agglutination. I, I think gluten, I always think that's sticky substance and leaks. So, with agglutination, what it's doing is it's sticking all these bacteria together. It's like a chain gang now. This bacteria alone was dangerous, that one alone was dangerous, that one alone was dangerous. But what it just did is it chains them all together. So they can't move very fast and they can't cause it, cause destruction. So when the antibodies directly attack, they can do those two. And the third is precipitate. If you've ever been in a chemistry lab and you make a precipitate, what is that? You take a liquid chemical and it precipitates, which means it starts turning solid and floating to the bottom, right? So it's pulled out of the solution and it's dropped to the bottom. Same idea. When you make a precipitate out of these bacteria, you do just stick a bunch of them together, they get really heavy and they fall out of the circulation. They can't travel. And ideally they go down to like the liver and they get chewed up or processed. So they can directly attack. The other thing is opsonization. So they can hold on to this for a short time, but they can also turn on more immune response. So I'm going to put a little Whisper over you on the next slide, too. Which one do you think is more powerful? One antibody directly attacking this one bacteria, or one antibody attacking the bacteria and turning on an immune response, more significant immune response? Stopping one bacteria, or triggering a response to stop thousands? Yeah, it's like when you see the scary movies and that one person, you know the bad guy, the killer, is like in the next room, they're like, oh, I'm going to go in. Dumbass call for backup, right? This is the same idea. If they directly attack, it's like them going in by themselves. If they attack and they signal optimization, where are they going? The call for backup. It's a bigger, more powerful response. It's that cascade response that we were talking about before. So direct attack is actually weak. The indirect, where it signals others, is more powerful. And I put this list on here so that... Oh, and I even put a star up in the corner just to remind you it's important. But there you go, there's a clumping. They stick together. So precipitation means they become thick and they actually get processed by well, typically the liver. Neutralization and loses its toxic properties. Whatever was dangerous about it, you attack that sucker. Like a good example is an antibody against 
tetanus toxin. It's a toxin finds the antibody and they stick together. It's no longer dangerous. So you can have the toxin in your body, but it just can't hurt them. And then this optimization, this turns on that complement cascade, that snowball effect. And how it does is it turns these other processes on. It turns on chemotaxis, the contraction of the area, it stimulates the inflammation through the mast cells, and it causes lysis because of that membrane attack complex. <coughs> so these top ones are what you're going to know with the and basically it turns on this process down here. So you get a bigger, more powerful response by pulling in friends. So I always think the direct is like the guy that goes and do it by himself. Just why do that? Call for backups. Optimization. Next thing you want to know are the classes. And I remember the word game. G-A-M-E-D. Game. Part of the reason I remember it because the G is the most abundant. And they call them I G G S I G what? A I G M I G E and I G D. So the first one, I G G, this is the most abundant. That's the first thing you remember. This is the most abundant going through your system all the time. So if something gets in, hopefully the I G G grabs it. The second thing you want to remember, this is the one that can actually go across the placenta. This could be good or bad. It can be good because it's protecting the baby. It could be bad if it's looking for the baby's blood type that's not like mommy's. Because what's going to happen if that IgG gets over the placenta? It's going to attack the baby's blood and cause it to destroy the baby's, to destroy the baby's blood. So IgG is the first one. About 80 to 85 percent of all the circulating antibodies are this IgG stuff, and it goes across the placenta. Uh, the second one, IgA, this is also it has to do with babies. What you want to know with that? And the IgA, it's a little bit bigger. They call that tiny. But instead of being one floating, like the IgG that near a monomer, it's actually two of them stuck back to back, so it's like double powerful. This is in breast milk. It's in saliva. It's in the mucus secretion. It's in sweat. What line of defense is that helping? First, second, or third? First, right? So it's out of the barriers on the skin, in the GI tract. It's going up to the surface. It's in breast milk. It's leaving mom's body and going where? It's to line the baby. Exactly. So it's going into the baby's mouth, and it's going into all the mucus in the baby's mouth, which goes down into its stomach, its GI tract. But what else does it go into when it goes into the mouth? goes into the lungs. Yeah, it helps coat the lungs. So if they inhale some kind of bacteria, hopefully these IgAs are going to grab a hold of it. So the big important thing about IgAs, they're in milk, and they're in secretions that go to the outside part of the body. They're in breast milk and secretions. Tears, saliva, sweat, they all have these IgAs. They're important for the first line of defense, especially in a baby that doesn't make their own. Mom gives it to you as a first line of defense. And the third one, the M, look at these monsters. They're called a pentamer. They've made up five of these antibodies. They're like the Chinese Death Star. You know, like the throwing star of the immune system. Those things you can throw them and it doesn't matter. They're pointy all the way around, right? So they're going to do some kind of damage. But these things are big and they're moving really quick. So they're the largest ones. And even though the IgGs are the most abundant, IgMs are actually the first ones to come out in an infection. We'll talk about that too. When you're first exposed to something, like when you get vaccinated, these are the ones that are first produced in bulk. They come out. Why would you make a lot of these in bulk at first? They're huge. They're dangerous. Yeah, they're just rolling all through your blood and circulation to try to grab anything that looks like that, that little rock area. And then the E, the big point when we're taking home with this one is the E is associated with allergic reactions. So what type of cell would you also associate E with? Of course it's going to be associated with the B cell, but what's the other one? Allergic reactions. Basophils and mast cells. Those are the first two. You're right with the centophils too. But basophils and mast cells, and I'll show you how they work in a second. But the IgE is associated with Allergies. So what chemical should they also be associated with in your mind? 
automatically think histamine. Yep, these are the ones that trigger histamine. If you have a lot of the IgE against something like peanuts, man, if this thing binds to a peanut, it's going to create this massive or reaction in your body. You don't want a ton of the IgEs. They're good self-defense, but man, they blow things out of proportion. And then I wish I had something fun and interesting to say about the Ds, but the Ds we actually know the least amount. We really don't know exactly why the Ds are there. We know they're present on developing lymphocytes, but other than that, we really don't know much about them. So the big ones. What do you want to remember when I say G? G Tennessee. Yeah, wrong G. But most abundant, and they can cross the placenta. Yeah. When I talk about the A's, breast milk and first line of defense for you. Yeah, secretion. Sweat, tears, mucus. What about the M's? Huge. And they're also the first one you get in infection. Yeah. So whenever this thing gets in your body, they're the first one to respond. And then what about the E's? Allergies. And anything associated with allergies. So you want to think what types of cells? Mast and basophil primarily. And then what's the chemical? Cysteine. And then D's, big trina. So here's just a picture of how this is the in your book and how it works. So you have this cell. This little IgE sitting on the surface of the mast cell, when it gets triggered, it causes degranulation in the mast cell and it stimulates the sonophils out of the area. It says, hey, this is kind of affected the agent. What's the first thing that happens? This is a chemotactic factor, remember? You have the neutrophil and the sonophil chemotactic factor. What are these granules for, though? Histamine, yep. So they're packed with the histamine, and the histamine is going to cause that inflammatory response. Typical inflammation, the edema and the edema. And then the connective tissue cell that degranulates, I think I've beat this one to death, that's the mast cell. What's the equivalent of it that floats in your blood? Basophil. Yep. And then you already know what's in the granules. You have the chemotactic factors and the histamine. And you also know which granule site focuses on parasitic attack. Basophil. Yep. Okay, so the more of these IgEs, by the way, that you have, the more sensitive these mast cells are. It all takes a little bit of that toxin in your environment to trigger response. That's why you and I can eat peanuts, but how can you get earlier? Okay, that's why everybody in this room can eat peanuts and we don't die from it. But the people that are worse to the peanuts is that their body has literally lined all these mast cells and these beta cells with these IgEs. They're coated. So all it takes is a little piece of floating along and trigger that degranulation. For us, if we have these and a peanut piece of peanut oil is sliding around, it doesn't bother the small cell, it doesn't care. But for those people that are highly sensitive to it, it just takes a little bit to go along and away. Okay. And then IgA, where do you typically find it? Secretions. So breast milk and then the line the GI stuff. And then here's how the response happens. So Here's what happens in your initial response, this red, burning whatever line. I get exposed to whatever this invader is, and I slowly start responding. Look at my response. Look how long it takes for me to start making IgGs or IgMs as a response. Up to 10 days, and I barely have a response. So I'm getting sick all during this time. I get this slow wait period where this bacteria is replicated. If I give you a bacteria and put it on a petri dish and have, it put, have you put it on your kitchen counter, Within a week, that thing's covered. I mean, you'll see the slimy, nasty growth covering. But that's in your body where it has plenty of sugar, nice warm environment, and the water, what's going to do? Grow even faster. That's called the latent period. This stuff's growing in your body. It's going to start making you sick. You look at your immune system. Slowly, slowly, slowly. So you start getting the symptoms of this thing building up. That's your first response. Right? And then, as you start coming out here, the IgM starts being produced. What's special about the IgM? Yeah. IgM, and then later you get some IgG produced. And it's nice because the IgG lingers around. It's more abundant. It stays out in your system. So it's giving the fat that you have. But that primary response, look at it. To get to its peak, you're better than 20 days in. And at its peak. And is it really very powerful? Not really. You got sick, you got nasty, you're like, uh. And that's why you 
You get over to your cold, but you still feel cr- like crap for several days afterwards. You still, you're still fighting it. You're just over the bad part. The second time you're exposed, now you have all these memory cells that are just waiting. What are the memory cells? Two of the bees. The bees, right? So the bees, they can make antibodies. They're hanging out there. As soon as they see the first sign of that reinfection, look at the response. Huge. So right away, within just a few days, you've got the same kind of response that took you 20 or better days before. So you've got this huge response, IgM, IgG, that cranks out really, really, really rapidly and kind of stop this thing right away. So within like less than five days, you've got this huge response. So it's anim- it's in the word. It's based off the word amnesia. So amnesia is talking about what? Forgetting things, right? When you have amnesia, you forget things. So what's an amnesia? It's without amnesia, right? So in other words, it's saying it's a memory. So I, like I said, I hate saying that word. Anna, it's without amnesia. I still can't. Looking at it, I still can't say it anymore. But this response, the secondary exposure, means that you have this memory response. It's the things the way it's done. You know, scientists. It's like double negatives all over the place. And that secondary response is primarily because of G. 80, 85% of circulating, circulating antibodies are those from past experiences. So faster response, more powerful response. And that's why when you're a kid, we give you a sample of something like measles. And since this thing, the measles, isn't going to hurt you, it can hang around during that waiting period while you're spiking. That was wrong. Let's do something about that. When you get used to it, and that's also why sometimes when you get a flu shot, how do you feel the next couple days? It's like crap. Did you get the flu? No, you didn't get the flu. You just got, your body is going, holy cow, this thing doesn't belong here. What's it doing? It's fighting it. Your body's fighting that infection, but it's not a dangerous infection. If you get the real flu, that can be dangerous and potentially fatal. You're getting a, a dumbed down version. And your body is fighting, you feel tired and drained. And I've learned, it seems like about every other time I get that shot, I feel like I have the flu the next day. So I never plan anything afterwards. But so that you feel like crap, right? You feel terrible, and then like two days later, you're okay again. If you really got the flu, you'd be fighting that for weeks. You know, potentially even life threatening situation. You know what they say, if, uh, if you get a cold, it lasts on average for seven days, but if you go to see a doctor about it, it only lasts for a week. <laughs> but it, this is why. When you first get the cold, that cold is a different strain every time you get it. It's a different type. It's mutated. You know, you know all about that. It's changed just enough that it sneaks by your immune system and makes you feel like crap for about like, three to ten days. Just before you start feeling a little bit better. And then we talked about IgMs, IgGs. And here's the significance. So this is before you're born, right? So nine months and then the Look at your immune system. Here you have these IgGs that are climbing. Why are the IgGs climbing in the baby? Because this immune system is being really, really strong? It's because it's IgGs can do what from mom? They cross the placenta. Yep. So IgGs from mom will come along here body and then they get transported across the placenta and dump in the field situation. And they get really, really high and for about nine months, baby born with these really high levels, they stay low for a day or two and then what happens? They start plummeting. Why are they plummeting? There's no placenta anymore, right? So you can't transport them. What can mom give the baby, though? IgA, breast milk. So as the IgGs from mom keep dropping, because what the baby started with here at day one, you see its immune system starts kind of climbing. So right here, is its immune system as good as it was the day it was born? No. This is where it's a crossover. So if you look at around six six or seven months, we know what the baby's immune system. It's not as low as, you know, I shouldn't say as low as it's going to get, but for a typical baby, that's about the lowest point. So they start getting more cold and get susceptible to about cold around six or seven months. Because those, what, active or passive immunity that mom gave? The passive immunity mom gave 
is dropping down to its lowest while the active immunity is starting to build. So the baby, you know, beyond the year, is still working with getting us to what the day is for. That's because of the placenta. Once the placenta is gone, there's no more transport from mom. The only way mom can help the baby is by breastfeeding. So there's a plug for breastfeeding. Okay. And then pediatrics. So. Yeah, she was breastfeeding, but Not for the IgGs. Mm -hmm. But with the IgAs, it would kind of like level off across here and stay pretty consistent. As long as she's breastfeeding breastfeeding consistently and not using like formula. Don't get me started. I'm all for the breastfeeding and I think that, forget the pumps, I think mom should get up at night and feed the baby. So. And I'll stick to that. No matter who listens to these lectures. Just, just in case. Anyway. I get to be a sexist pig once in a while. My own benefit, then I can sleep through the night and I'll just look fine. Keep my fingers crossed. Yep. I'm hoping for one of those babies that sleeps through the night. Since she's active all day long, I'm hoping that you know, the sleeper. Okay, anyway, so pediatrics. Um, neonates, they automatically have a depressed inflammatory response because look at this chart. If they're born early, what did they not get a chance to do? They didn't get a chance to build up all the IDs. So now, in Typically, neonates, they don't breastfeed, do they? I, don't, I guess I don't know that much about neonates as far as breastfeeding. They give them real breast milk. Oh, well, that's a good thing. But I, I was thinking at one time it was that when they were neonatal, they kept them kind of isolated so that even mom didn't have that much contact. They do apply maybe after Oh, gotcha. Well, that's good. But, yeah, their IgGs are really, really low. Right? And then their body hasn't had exposure to the outside yet. So even the neutrophils aren't capable of doing things. They don't know. Basically, their neutrophils are babies, too. They don't understand chemotaxis. So they have to learn how to do that. So they don't know what they're doing yet. And they don't have enough complement. Basically, all of their responses are, are depressed. So you have to worry about overwhelming sepsis with neonates. And then again, with that slide, just make sure you remember the difference between active and passive immunity. And I asked you this question earlier, but with mom's IgG induced into the baby, what form of immunity is it? It's passive immunity. Yeah. And it down. Okay, the next part. This is going back to that whole headhunter thing. So this is how it actually happens. What kind of cells was it that I talked about earlier that were headhunters that ate something and carried it around? Macrophages. Yep. We're going to actually change the name to an antigen-presenting cell because macrophages are a type of antigen-presenting cell, but they're not the only type. So in general, cells that can grab a hold of, eat, swallow, and bear that little head are called antigen-presenting cells because they literally present an antigen. So in this situation, here I have the macrophage. It grabs whatever it is, eats it, destroys it, and then what it does is it pops a little antigen off on the surface. And then it'll go around and parade around, and they'll show all the other cells, like the B cell and the T cell, hey, this is what the invader looks like, or it's just like this head, hunt for it. So it's looking for little receptors, because it's called the B cell receptors, or the T cell receptors. And then that epitope, that little fragment, the head itself, binds to a structure called a peritope, which I'm not going to make them write epitopes and peritopes, but they just have names for these things. You need to remember that actual antigen is presented to another type of white blood cell. The original cell is called antigen presenting, and then they have to have a special states to be able to detect each other. If you presented this, let's say um, you showed the head to a mast cell, we even the mast cell is over here. Hey, there's an invader. Looks, looks like this with mast cells. Oh my god! Like that little squid in Finding Nemo. Oh! I inked myself. But the mast cells, they degranulate. They get triggered and they release. A macrophage, if it were stimulated, what is it going to do? It's going to want to... It's like, it's like that chaff stuff again. It's, if you show the shark, fish, other fish, blood, or pieces of other fish, it goes crazy. They just get real excited and they start swimming like nuts. That's the way macrophage responds. You, turn, you stimulate a macrophage with the scent of bacteria or scent of food and it goes nuts goes crazy chasing after and looking for that invader. Right? So here's how it works. 
this thing called MHC, a major disk of compatibility complex. This is important for the state. It's the actual state you pop the head on, but there's another reason you want to know it. This is the reason when people get a transplant, they get transplant rejection. These MHCs are special to you. You have your own formula for an MHC. Other people have their own. All humans have MHCs, but we have our own special <coughs> shape of MHC. So one headhunter might have a special, like, jagged state that's unique to its body. Or somebody else might have a perfectly straight state. But they're called MHCs. And they're just sugar proteins. So when I get exposure to that antigen and it comes inside the cell, so it's the macrophage, it goes in a macrophage, it takes a little piece of the head, it sticks it to the special shape state, right here, the little, well, it's like an X. Instead of reaching up, I'm just going to do this. So the antigen comes in, it goes over to the ER, in the plasma reticulum, makes this protein sugar structure, transports it to the Golgi, you know this whole process, packages it, ships it to the surface, and now you have it displayed. I was about to say, if you need to get a drink of water, you can go do it, but I think that's what caused it, wasn't it? <laughs> that's like adding fire to fire. <coughs> but um, anyway, it puts this little stake on the surface with the antigen up there, so that this antigen-presenting cell now can go along to one of its other friends and say, hey, that's what the invader looks like, let's go get it. Right? Sometimes they're also referred to as HLAs, human leukocyte antigen. It's the same as human, and you find out leukocytes. What are leukocytes? But MHC is what you usually hear it referred to as. I just don't want you to get goofed up if you ever see HLA or what the hell is that. So they're all over every cell in your body. These little MHCs are everywhere. That's why transplants are so difficult. The only place you don't find a true MHC is on the surface of a red blood cell. So that's why you can take blood from one person and give it to another person. However, red blood cells, they don't have MHCs. What do they have on the surface, possibly? The A and B antigens, right? So, the major piece of compatibility complex is the stink that's missing from red blood cells, but red blood cells can have their own little antigen on the surface. So, if I give somebody a liver, my liver's covered with my shaped MHCs all over the place. I put those in their body. What's their body think of my MHCs? You don't belong. I don't care if you're human or not, you don't belong in any of so, in a situation, let's say a virus goes in. A virus goes into a cell like this. It goes in, and the cell says, oh, crap, I'm affected by a virus. What's the name of the cytokine of the virus that goes to the That cell's going to release. Do you remember? Interferon. Interferon. It interferes with viruses being moved. Interferon. And then that cell will actually take a little piece of that virus and poke it up to the surface so that the other cells can come along and recognize it and say, oh, that's what the virus looks like. So in this situation, you see, it takes that virus coating, pops that little piece of virus to the surface and says, number one, kill me because I'm infected with the virus, and this is what the virus looks like to protect yourself. Right. So where are MHCs? Number one is they're all over the body. But you have two shapes. You have a class one and a class two. So you look at these class ones, and you're going to slide right on down, right there. To react with CD8 on a PC cell. That paper pen is that one here. <coughs> so it reacts with this, yeah, it re reacts with something called CD8, and I'll tell you why I'm going to do that in a second. So it reacts with CD8 on a T cell. The second one, the class 2, reacts with CD4 on a TH cell. And the underlying this, and a little side note, right, HIV. That's the thing that allows HIV to actually spread through your body. You need this little thing, the CD4 receptor and your T cell, so that they can get the word, they can get the message. You spread the antigen and then body it, and they go, oh, okay, now I can start attacking this kind of infected agent. Unfortunately, this little thing is also the same thing HIV can go on with, oh, you're human. Grab a hold of it and pull the cell in. So would it be good to actually, if you were doing HIV, would it be good to take something that would destroy this receptor? No. It makes it so that HIV can't get into your cell. The problem is what happened now. Your body has no idea if an infected agent came along. So with HIV, what does it do to your immune system? It destroys it, right? It shuts down your immune system. 
suppress your immune system. The problem is if you took a drug to stop this exact same receptor, what did you just do to your immune system? Same thing, but it's suppressed it completely. Okay, so MH, oh sorry, also MH1, these are on every cell in your body. Right? I understand the last that they're different. And they respond with those CD8 receptors on the T cell. The class 2, you want to find on antigen cells like macrophages, white blood cells. And then there's that same process that you saw before. You take whatever that antigen is, you put it through the endoplasmic reticulum, you package it, you put it on the NHC, and you pop it up on the surface. So if this were a macrophage, you've got the class 1 cells that are on all the cells, but you also have the class 2 that makes it an antigen presenting cell. That's probably the trickiest part. Yeah. So the class one cells are on every cell. The the MHC, the class one are on every cell, exactly, right? Uh, class two though are only on some. That's yep. the HIV attacks that specifically, but it's also on like macrophages. It's on right? it's on the macrophages or the antigen presenting cells. So we didn't talk about the dendritic cells, but those are antigen presenting cells. They're the same idea. They come from a monocyte and they eat other cells. So when HIV attacks, though, it would also attack the macrophage. It attacks the receiving end. Okay. So, yeah, it, it attacks the receiver, which is that T helper cell. And we'll talk about that, too. Because white, HIV attacks the white blood cells, specifically the T helper cells, which we haven't talked about yet. And then here's why you have a problem with transplants. So I skip this in genetics and then you're going to back here. You have MHCs, yours. What did this round thing mean? You know, M squares, you know. So you've got the round, there's mom, and there's dad. Mom's MHCs have a special code just like this. <laughs> Dads have a special code. Are they identical? Nope. Like, not even at all. I remember, like, there's not even one number, one set. Oh, yeah, there's, there's one set of number here that's the same. So, they don't match at all. When they have children, though, children get one from mom and one that strips from dad. So, half of them makes you looks like mom, half looks like dad. There's a chance of having a 100% match of a child to one of his parents. So having a hundred percent match, having this child was exactly it like one of his parents. Oh, I thought that was mine. <laughs> I'm warning all kinds of new things on my phone. So if you got one from mom and one from dad, what's the chance of you having a perfect match to dad? Zero. At, well, at best, you're exactly going to have a fifty percent match to dad and a fifty percent match to mom. So. There's no way you'd be a perfect match to either of your parents. At best, it would be a 50%. But if you look, there's, let's say, I'm going to color this. This is a bunch of circles, this is a bunch of lines, and then this is a bunch of straight over lines. So I can match it. So in this situation, I have, I can get this from dad, and I can get either circles from mom, or I can get this from dad, and what from mom? One, right? And then one of my siblings could get this from mom and that from dad, or get this from mom and that from dad. How many possible combinations can we have up there? Four possible combinations to have the other blank. So you've got another blank like this blank and the straight across. Okay. Why are there five up there? If you can only have four possible combinations, why are there five pictures up there? Because these two are exactly the same, right? So if there are only four possible combinations between that you or your siblings can have if you have the same parents, what's the odds of you perfectly matching one of your siblings? One in four. Twenty-five percent chance. So it could be you born here and then your next sibling was this one for your perfect match. So if you need to borrow a kidney, borrow a kidney, like I'm planning, just in case I need a kidney in the future, I'm wording it appropriately. Since I did push, I mean, my brother accidentally fell down, I didn't do that. 
say, hey, yeah, you got that extra kidney. You mind if I borrow that for 15, 20, 30 years? Yeah, I'll give it back when I'm done with it. Um, that's how I got it. That's all that you know. <laughs> anyway, so there's a 25% chance that you're uh, an ideal match and then your are circling, but at best, your parents would be a they're more, there's not going to be a perfect match with your with your parents. So it's these MHCs. These MHCs, when you pass them down from generation to generation, you split these up and you one half of the So when you do a transplant, this is the part that rejects it. It's like having a little steak for you. you know, it's straight for you, but your brother is straight with a little bend at the end. Or your sister's is a little straight as bent the other way. Or another one's whoop, but straight at the top. There's a 25% chance that one of your siblings has an MC that's just like yours. To find somebody outside, look at all these different number combinations. It's like a screw lottery with thousands of numbers randomly associated in thousands of different patterns. It's slim. And it's transplant. And we'll talk about transplant. <laughs> There are, but if your if your parents have these specific codes, mm -hmm. then they can't change those codes. They can just give you what they oh, had in the past on. Yeah. So this came from half of their parents, and then just keeps doing that half and half and half and half. All right. And then APC stands for what? Do you remember? Oh. Can't just present. And then they mediate that immune response. So there's your macrophage up here again. Up here. Eating your bacteria, swallowing it, popping that little antigen up on the MHC. It cruises along. When it recognizes the other cells, like the B cells and T cells, it tells them, hey, there's what the invader looks like. Let's go kill it. Before, I showed you the B cells. And what are the B cells going to make to fight infection? Antibodies, exactly. These are the T cells. What are they associated with? Humoral or cell mediated? Cell mediated. So the T cells, they actually are like the Marines. If the T cells were the Air Force that fly over, they don't like to get dirty. They drop stuff on the ground or shoot things. The Marines like to go in right in, do hand to hand combat, and kill things. If you know a Marine, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Once a Marine, always a Marine. I have friends that are Marines and I like going out and having a beer with them, but if there's any kind of brawl anywhere in the bar, it doesn't matter if they didn't they didn't even know that people were there before. If there's a brawl, it's like they go fight. You know? They know. And they want to be a part of it. It doesn't matter. That's what the T cells are like. The T cells are eager for a war. So if anything gets in and they are told by the antigen presenting, hey, there's an invader in here, they're like, oh yeah, it's on. Like Donkey Kong. I have no idea what that means. Never have. So these T cells are just going to go crazy, crazy. They're going to go looking around. They're going to find the invaders. They're going to grab a hold of it, and they're going to punch a hole. They literally perforate. They punch holes in the invader. And they lice the invader, and then they're happy to cruise on, right? So the T cells they don't make antibodies. They actually have to have physical contact with the invader. They grab a hold of them. They release a thing called a perforin that punches a hole in it, a chemical, and they destroy the cell. There are different types of T cells. Like the T, when you see the little sub C, it means cytotoxic. This one that does the hand-to-hand -hand contact, that's a cytotoxic T cell. It releases these cell toxins, cytotoxins, to destroy the remainder. It's a T C cell. There's another one called a TH cell, which is a T helper cell. T helper cells don't really like to do the actual combat. But they're kind of like the generals. They go up to the front line, but they're directing where everybody else should go. They tell everybody else where they're supposed to go. So they like to get into the combat. They don't make antibodies. They like to get into the combat, but they tell all the other ones to do what to do. TH cells are the ones that HIV attack. So you have all these warriors out in the field, but what did you just lose if HIV gets in to kill all your TH cells? The direction. Yeah, you've got all these warriors. They have no idea what they're supposed to be doing because nobody's telling them what to do. So they're just kind of like wandering around destroying things, but they're not destroying the right things. Yeah. You have another one's called a TS cell. It's called toxic suppressor cell. 
The T cell is a suppressor cell. It's like the MPs. What's an MP? I'm still using the military. I don't know what an MP is. Military police, right. So if the T helper cells are like the general, the MPs are kind of like the police that keep everything calm so that these don't get out of hand. If these get rowdy, they can destroy the wrong types of tissue. The, two, the suppressor cells calm them down. They say, whoa, 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 slow down. Unfortunately, as we age, we make fewer and fewer TS cells. So what might happen? If they were there to suppress or slow down overreaction by these cytotoxic cells, what could happen? They say, hey, the cops are busy or the cops are they're not looking. What can we do? Let's make a mess. They start destroying things. They start destroying you. What kind of... What kind of disorder does that cause? Autoimmune, yeah. So as we age, we have less and less tumor suppressor cells, which means we have more and more what type of disease? Autoimmune disorder. Yeah. And then the last one's called the TD cell. And the TD stands for delayed. They're like the Gomer pile. I have no better example. They're just lazy. So they're delayed. They hesitate. Instead of going right in and fighting, they're kind of like slow. They're delayed. Like, a good example that we'll talk about later is that when you get poison ivy, when poison ivy gets on you, it stimulates this response. You've got this infective agent that's going into your skin, but does it happen right away? Within two hours, what happens? The next morning when you wake up, then you've got this inflammatory response. It's because what's happening are the delayed cells are finally kicking in like 24 hours later. They were lazy. They were not eager to get on the scene. And then do you remember where the T cells mature? The thymus. Do you remember where they're made? The bone marrow. Yep. So I'll put that up there again. They're made in the bone marrow, but they develop in the thymus. And the thymus is right in front of the heart. So it's in the mediastinum and your chest cavity. After the age of 25, it just keeps shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. So what does it tell you about your immune system and your T-cells? They get worse and worse and worse, which explains why you're older, you get a worse response. And that word immunocompetent just means that that's where boot camp was at. Me and my, all my military now, I hate military movies, but it's made in but to be competent, that's where they go for boot camp and they actually get trained to do their fighting. Now they're competent to work in the immune system. Okay, so the TC cells, I already gave you some of these. The T regs are the same as the TS. Your book is called T regulator cells, but you'll see them more commonly everywhere else I've ever looked, they call them TS, or T suppressor cells. Regulator suppressors. All they're doing is trying to slow down. When you see the TC cells, the cytotoxic T cells, they also call them TA, and that is significant because they have a CD8 on their surface. What did that mean? That was the little thing that responded to the NHCs. The T helper cells, they also call T4s. Why do they call them T4s? Because they have a CD4 on their surface that responds to NHCs. So... The cytotoxic cells they call T8s, the T helpers, the T4s, and we definitely have to remember the T helpers because when you when you're bumping into other things about um, well, HIV, AIDS, other immunocompromising disorders, they talk a lot about the T4 cells, which I don't kind of feel like they don't touch the AIDS T4 No response. Three forty-three. So the T helper cells. When you look at this, you've got a macrophage with an extra resistance cell. There's a T helper right in the middle. Remember? Here are all your warriors. You've got some T helper cells, you've got the B cells, you've got the mast cells, you've got stem cells, you have macrophage neutrophils, natural killer cells, all these warriors all over the place. Who's controlling them? The TH, look, the TH is sending out interleukins to all these other cells telling them what to do. If you lose the TH, you don't see the mast cells talking directly to the B or the stem cells, right? You don't see um, well, the macrophage talking, uh, I'm not going to talk to these all, that was a bad example. 
But you don't see the talk is uh, magical or something. Put it over there. They need to see help yourself. Without them as the general or the director, you lose communication between all of the forces. You still have the immune structures, but they just don't work as well anymore. So the T helper cells are absolutely necessary. If you lose them because of what disorder, HIV, yep, then you're in a world of hurt. There's some subsets of T helpers, and then what they've actually found is that sometimes these T helper cells, they don't regulate appropriately, and they send the truth into the wrong areas. Like if this is brain tissue, and they start sending the truth in over across the brain tissue, and they start attacking the mind of the chief, what disease that is caused? MS, multiple sclerosis. Right. So, um, you don't have to worry about the subtypes. It was just the, the T1 cells, they're actually there for helping cell mediated immunity, where the twos are for humoral immunity. So, in other words, T helper cells like to talk to what type? It's cell mediated. They like to talk to T cells, where the TH2 cells control the B cells. So are, the, are B cells and T cells always acting at the same time? The B cells and T cells? Yes and no. Um, it depends on the situation, what you're exposed to. Like, B cells really have very little to do with tumors like cancer, or T cells do, so sometimes there are situations where they don't work at the same time. Yeah. So it's not like you're getting a cancer And then I put this, this is, these are the pictures from your book, where it shows the whole process. Here's the production of the NHCs. So I pop them from the surface, and then here's how they communicate. So you have an NHC class 2 that comes along and binds to CD4 and T helper cell. What tells the T helper cell to do, T helper will start replicating, and it'll actually, in mitosis, create the ones that are going to have to combat and some that create memory for long lasting production. Other cells, like if I have a cell here that says I have an infection, and it pops its little surface marker up here. You have something like a natural killer cell that comes along, recognizes that marker, and says, All right, you've got an infection, I'll pass the word, and it helps the kill itself. So it helps us go through apoptosis so that what, if that was infected, what's it not going to do? It's not going to replicate Because if you have an infected, a virally infected cell, and it replicates, you just replicate the virus and everything. The fact is, as long as this cell is still alive, that virus can run its machinery and make more viruses. So by the cell killing itself, it's kind of altruistic. It's taking itself out of the population so that there's no way that virus can replicate. So I just, those are some different slides. Just put them all on one slide. And then aging, like you said, the thymus just keeps shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, which decreases your immune system more and more and more. And there's your question, but we already answered it. Okay. And then what this says for older adults, it increases their risk for autoimmune disorders. It increases the risk for infections. And you already know that their skin keeps getting what? Thinner and thinner and thinner. It's easier, more easily ripped. They have fewer mast cells. So they get oh, not as a rapid immune response or inflammatory response. It slows down their healing. And of course, your circulatory system is slowing down too. So more infections. And then make sure you absolutely understand these things like innate versus acquired, humoral versus cell mediated, active versus passive. And then you can actually look up some of these things like natural killer cells. And the thing you really want to look for in natural killer cells, take a peek at cancer. So look at what natural killer cells do for cancer. General rule of thumb is if it doesn't belong in your body, natural killer cells don't have to be worn, they don't have to be told, they don't have to do anything. If it doesn't belong, they will kill it. They're a natural killer. If it doesn't look like it belongs to you, it's dead. If it's a tumor cell that looks a little bit different than you, it's dead. So the biggest benefit, like we talked about before with cancers and tumors, is that if they can mutate and they look less like you, the better off you are. And we already talked about complements, you know, really have to look out for. So these biological models, response modifiers, you can actually manipulate your immune system you know, to build it up or attack things like cancer cells. I think that was it, right? Oh, yeah. Well, I think we're done. Yeah. 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 Yeah.